Aloha. I'm Marsha Joy, and we, this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey. And today, the odyssey is not 10,000 years ago, but right here, right now, on the Big Island. Or anybody that doesn't know where the Big Island is, it's the island of Hawaii. And it's called the Big Island because it is a big island. And my guest today is Mike Ruggles, and he has a story to tell. And don't miss it, don't go away. Stay tuned because you can't miss one word of Mike's story. Mike, are you there? I am. Aloha, everybody. Aloha. So, Mike Ruggles is, I think, an angel in that he is taking care of people at the end of their lives with medical cannabis. Now, that might sound, well, okay, but what's hospice for? Well, hospice, because it is paid for by Medicare, cannot give people at the end of their lives cannabis. Well, you know how crazy Uncle Sam is. So here's a, an angel that creates a facility that does all kinds of wonderful things for people on the Big Island. So, Mike, tell us the story from beginning to end. All right, I'm going to give everybody a quick Reader's Digest version because <laughs> this actually started back in 2007. And what happened that year was they had a, a police officer named John Weber, and he was Officer of the Year uh, by George Bush, who was the president then. And he made, was made Officer of the Year because he had busted over 1,100 cannabis users on the Big Island that year. And if you do the math on that, that's like over three a day if you work seven days a week. So this guy really was a world. And they gave him the award because they said uh, attention to detail is what? Because he got 100% conviction on over 1,000 a, a cannabis users that year. And so I was one of them that had been scooped up. And my parents were police officers. And so in the police report, he had me coming down the stairs. He had me saying, I don't care about my rights right now. And my wife and daughter have nothing to do with all these crimes or all these felonies. And, and who talks like that? Nobody does. And so it gave me an idea. I realized, hey, you know, this guy, he's pretty smooth at telling lies. He's probably done this a few times. And so I tried to put an ad in the paper, and, and it said, uh, you only get 12 le uh, words. So it said, uh, got legal cannabis but been busted anyway, <laughs> and it had my phone number. And so the lady at, at the Tribune Herald said, hey, you can't. I'm sorry, we can't print this, because I was trying to put it in the personals. And she said, we can't print this. I said, why not? She said, because it's not legal. I said, well, yeah, it's medical. If it's medical, it's legal. She's like, no, it's not legal. And we got into an argument, and she hung up on me. <laughs> and so I had her on speed dial, and I called her back. And she hung up on me again, and I called her back. And finally, I get this male voice. It sounded like God. Is this Mike Ruggles? Oh, I forgot this part. This is the funny part. Because I said, because the only other personal ad in the paper at the time was a guy that said, spaceship leaving for Jupiter on a bayfront. On, on, and he had the date, bring your own weapons. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, really? You can have a spaceship leaving for Jupiter? Bring your own weapons? But I can't put this dad. Anyway, she hung up on me. So finally, I get the male voice. And uh, he says, you still want to run the ad? I said, yes, I will run this ad. And so they run the ad. And within a week, I got over 100 phone calls of people all saying the same thing. John Weber, yep, didn't care about my rights. <laughs> so obviously, he used that thing quite a bit. And so we ended up suing John Weber. We joined this, we made this club. We were called Friends for Justice. And uh, a couple of the more uh, hippie, uh, older people that had been busted, and they were actually like in stage four cancer. In fact, the one guy ended up surviving from the medicine we made for him. That was right about when Phoenix Tears came out. 
you know, you guys are familiar with Rick Simpson and Finney yes. anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, so right about that time, shit, I lost my train of thought. You know, it always <laughs> happens when I start thinking about, you know, hospice and people that have passed. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so we started Friends for Justice, and what we would do is we would just go down to the courthouse and hang out like a hundred of us on each case. And I sued the uh, the one cop, and so Reverend Nancy was up to bat just like me, and uh, and everybody went down there for her. We're sticking up for her. We had a full galley just like I did. Only thing is, she went down, oh. and uh, I was shocked because we were doing medical, but with religion, you know, she was Reverend Nancy, and she was doing the religious, and I figured. Um, you know, that being the First Amendment, that she had a very strong case with Catholics being able to give children wine and, uh, you know, Indian churches had ayahuasca and, and peyote and all these other things. I thought, well, man, cannabis is a no-brainer. But what they ruled was, no, it's okay for, for churches, you know, legitimate churches like Catholic churches and all these other churches, but no uh, BS churches like <laughs> cannabis. And to me, that was a stunning ruling because now they're, they're, they're setting a yardstick on faith. And if you think about it, what does faith mean? Faith means you believe in something you can't prove. And so, essentially, he, I believe that ruling called all churches BS. And if you think about it, you know, essentially, when you, if you believe something you can't prove, that's faith. And so that means you believe in something that might not be rational. <laughs> anyway, they ruled against Reverend Nancy, and, uh, and so Friends for Justice, we became, uh, we went from Friends for Justice, what was the next name? Oh, we became the Alternative Pain Management Club. And so there was over a hundred of us, and you got to remember, these were all people that were charged by the same cop in 07, and uh, I ended up pleading guilty to a petty misdemeanor because, you know, it was like they gave me a deal. They said, look, either you plead, to, even though I was totally innocent, yeah, I was too, they, they claimed I was two grams over and then charged me with like five felonies, and even though I was totally innocent, Everybody said you'd be insane to fight this when they're offering you a petty misdemeanor, which is only 30 days, and they weren't even asking for time. So I took the petty misdemeanor. Anyway, we learned, and so way back then, what we were doing, uh, this is kind of a funny story, because we were looking at the law, and it said, if you have too much cannabis, you have to dispose of it according to the law, and then it, it, it listed the law, and I just happened to have a photographic memory, so I remembered it was 23-200-20. Is that a state law or federal law? Is that a state law? Yes, this was state. state law. It's an administrative state. rule. And where the law yeah. came from was that it was made years before we had a medical program. Ah, okay. And what it was designed to do was let pharmacists, and this is really kind of repugnant, it was designed to let pharmacists sell outdated uh, antibiotics to farmers. Huh? Yeah, and so now farmers could... could uh, keep their animals in more squalid conditions and still get uh, a good meat. The only problem was it started this horrible chain of people uh, getting antibiotics and it slowly made everybody resistant to antibiotics. And it was really a dumb move, but it started like 30 years ago anyway. So when they said, how do you dispose of, you gotta remember, schedule one drug, so is antibiotics apparently, so they created this rule, which said if you, you can dispose of it to anyone else who also has a prescription for it. And so remember, we didn't, it wasn't our idea to put this in there, they put it in there. And in fact, the only way we could find it, I had, I had to go to the law library. Because when you tried to click on it on your computer, it wouldn't open. And so I went down to the law library, and, you know, and the lady was like uh, the key maker in the matrix. She's like, oh, no, you can't not let me open something. And she had a special code, and it opened up. And so we printed it out. And so back then, what we would do is you can only care give for one person at a time, but it didn't say how long. So what we would do is, like, say I was caregiving for Sarah, I would sign a piece of paper saying, I'm no longer caregiving for Sarah, I'm now caregiving for Brittany. And then we would make the transfer, 
And then I, they would sign a piece of paper that says, I'm no longer caregiving from Whitney, I'm caregiving for Sarah again. And so what the law said, as long as the plants never changed location, you wouldn't have to uh, uh, turn in your card or do anything. You just had to send in the paperwork. And so we would send in the paperwork. And I'd get calls from the doctor and NED. They'd be like, what's this? And so I would tell them. And then no one ever once said, hey, don't do that. You're, you know, that's illegal, nothing. And so we did it like that until um, in 2013. And so what happened in 2013 was Act 178 passed. And Act 178, if you read the preamble to it, it says to remove obstacles so that the seriously ill and, you know, I believe hospice qualifies for that, can get access to the medicine they need. And so the preamble was great. And it, and what it did is if you look at 329, is it 122? 121, 329, 121. It used to say that uh, distribution was only protected between patient and caregiver. And what Act 178 did was it drew a line right through that and it's and it put in medical use. So now, if you look at 329, 121, the law, and everybody's welcome to look at it, and this is an important part of the story because I believe this is why I won, was found not guilty, was that um, because they wouldn't show the jury the law. And I brought it up three times. In my opening, I said, hey, look, at least make them show you the law that they say I'm breaking. And it was interesting because even though we were in a court of law, they would never break out the law and show it to the jury. And so I, I told the jury again, I says, hey, hey, make them show you the law. I said, you have the power to, 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 to ask for it, and I think they'll have to show it to you. So they did. They requested the law. And in my opinion, had they shown them the law, well, then obviously because uh, they were, you know, there was uh, – you know, they were working on it. It wasn't an immediate verdict. So obviously some people thought I was guilty. Well, I believe the reason the judge didn't show him the law because he had it backwards. He thought the people that were rooting for me wanted to see the law, but actually it was the people that were rooting against me. Because I'm pretty sure the people rooting for me were going, hey, show us the law. If he's breaking it, well, then he's guilty. Well, they wouldn't show him the law, and I believe that's what created the doubt. Well, now... You know we need so when you're in a court of law and the law won't, I mean, in the court won't even show you the law, that creates a little bit of doubt, does it not? It does. Now, what we need to take a break, and when we come back, okay. we have 60 seconds. When we come back, I want you to tell us all about what happened in the court, all right, including, I'll let you know. including Leloy. All right. Okay. You got it. Aloha, my name is Victoria and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, see you soon. Mahalo. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanneman. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Marcia Joyner, and we're back. And what a great story this is. Mike Ruggles, please tell us now that you're in court this final time. Uh, tell right, us what no. happened. All right, so we get to court, and basically uh, what happened was we had been, uh, you know, I have like a bachelor's in this court case because <laughs> in the beginning I was charged with 32 felonies and a misdemeanor. Oh, my. And uh, you, you never lived until you had a judge tell you you're facing three lives and plus 32 years. Oh, dear. 
And, yeah, and I'd just gotten out of the hospital because while I was in jail, apparently my kidneys quit working, and I went into renal failure, acidified, got a pneumonia because they – and they keep you, and I'm, this is my next pet peeve as I'm going after the jails, but they threw me in what, me being an old guy, I knew used to be the rec room, and now they call it the fishbowl. And it's just this big room where they got over 100 people in it, and there's no bathroom, and everybody's laying on the floor. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, well, being an old guy, I ended up getting pneumonia, and my kidneys shut down and lost 70 pounds and all this other crap. Anyway, so we're back in court. Yeah, so. And um, you had the three cops, and they charged me, like I say, with 32 felonies and a misdemeanor. And it was all jive, and so for four years, me and my crew, uh, we made seven book boxes of paper to prove that every one of these lies were outrageous. In fact, one of them, the 150 plants, when they came up with the search warrant, they went on to my neighbor's property and took their cannabis and charged me with it. And when I went and had a survey done, they blocked the survey and wouldn't let me even show that they'd gone on to my neighbor's. Hey, and it only gets worse after that anyway. So right up to the day before court, suddenly they just dropped 31 charges. And, and my lawyer, uh, who is a great lawyer, I want to say, Stan Oshiro, he actually saved me because even though I was representing myself, he showed me how to uh, uh, do it effectively. Whereas I had six lawyers before that, all standby lawyers. And when they say standby, that's all they do. They just stand by you. <laughs> even though the county paid them $50,000, they never helped me one bit. When I got Stan Oshiro, man, he showed me how to do it. And then my crew was able to do it, and that's how we actually prevailed. But a little background on Leloy. So we have, they were doing this thing called compliance checks back in the day from 07. I want to say they just quit them. They might not even quit them, but they quit doing them to me. I had a gold star over my house. And so one day, uh, here comes Leloy with 15 other cops and the DEA. And I was a little upset because a good friend of mine, Jason Knapsinger, who was a combat Iraqi war veteran, they'd just done a compliance check on his house the day before, and he got upset and hung himself. Mm. And so I was a little upset. So when these guys came up the driveway, um, I started yelling at him and told him, hey, go get a warrant. And I brought up Jason Knapsinger, and I called them mother fornicators, <laughs> <laughs> only in a little more blunt terminology. And so Leloy, who's a big dude, he's bigger than me. I'm like 6'3", but he's like 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, and uh, anyway, he says, look, he says, you go get your cards, because I said, go get a warrant. He says, no, you go get your cards right now, or I'm going to come in there, kick your ass, and take all your cannabis. And that was really irritating to me because I'm actually a trained pugilist and I knew there was no way he could kick my ass. And so I let him know that. And uh, we almost got into it right then. Well, now, let me, put, let me inter satisfying. interject here that Leloy is a police officer, right. undercover, and, and he uh, is the, city count the county councilwoman's husband. Yes. So there's a and, whole uh, bunch of telekia here. Right, and it's not good stuff. What's going on is obviously not good, and so we stepped in front of it, and I didn't realize how bad it was. And so after that, these guys were targeting me. And in fact, one time, in fact, Reverend Nancy was here. We used to do the uh, weekly meeting, and I told her, hey, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, they're going to do a compliance check here. And everybody's like, well, how do you know? I said, well, they've been doing it so often, I pretty much know when they're going to come. And she says, well, if you believe that, I'll bring a camera. And so she came the next day, and guess what? I missed it by two hours. Oh. It was raining at 10. But by noon, here they came, and we can send you the link. We got the whole thing on video. And it's hilarious. They came up in a helicopter and landed in my neighbor's property and came over and said, hey, we're, we're here because Leloy sent us up here to do a compliance check. I got all that on video. Anyway, so now what happened was the reason we were even in court was uh, when they transferred the uh, cannabis program from NED to the health department, they were able to make new administrative rules. And when they did, we went down and fought them and said, man, we're like, this sounds like the wish list for the attorney general. Why? Because it was. <laughs> he was the guy that wrote them. 
And uh, so what happened was we opened January 2nd when Act 178 took effect. It was written, it passed in 2013, but didn't take effect till 2015. In that time, we asked everybody from the governor on down what to do, and they just stood silent. So anyway, we opened. And so what happened then, on July 18th, these new administrative rules took effect. And even though it doesn't, what it says in there, the new change, what it said was, um, once a cannabis patient has received his registration card, he should carry it on him whenever he's possessing. And this is key. You'll notice it doesn't say you have to wait until you have your card to acquire. It says once they give you your card, you should carry it on you. Well, they used this new law change to come after us. And so they had, because you got to remember, the undercover had come earlier before the law even changed. And, um, and I sent them away. I said, no, you got to go get us a, a recommendation from the doctor. Because if you look at the law, what it says is that your recommendation from the doctor will be good for one year from the time he signs it. And that's called your written certification. And so they tried to turn it into, you know, the undercover didn't have his registration card. But the facts are this. It's your written certification that allows you to use it. It's your registration card that allows you to grow it. And so you'll notice we weren't growing for him. And they tried to say that later what they gave the jury instructions was you must find Mr. Ruggles guilty if you find that he was not caregiving for the undercover agent. And you'll notice I never once said I was caregiving for him. And in fact, the cannabis that I transferred to him didn't belong to me, didn't belong to the person I was caregiving for, who was actually a police dispatcher but yet belonged to another member. And so I transferred one member's cannabis to an undercover who had a certificate, which meant he met the conditions of use. And they went and got a, and like I say, they wanted to shut me down. And I believe the reason they wanted to shut me down was I was suing the dispensaries at the time. And you're like, whoa, hold up. Why would a medical cannabis advocate sue the dispensaries? Well, it's because it's racketeering. Here's how it works. <laughs> if it's federal law, how you do it is this. You either enforce federal law against everybody in the state or you enforce federal law against nobody in the state. And so anyway, different story. But I was suing the dispensaries, and so the bottom line was this. The attorney general was, was upset because at one point I had the attorney general and all the most expensive lawyers. This was a kick on conference call, just like you guys. And I was all, hey, it's an easy fix, gentlemen. All you got to do is admit patients can do the same thing your dispensaries are doing. And then guess what? It's not racketeering. Because you got to remember, racketeering laws came from prohibition. And what would happen back during prohibition with alcohol is uh, they would pay off the mayor and the local cops, speakeasies, and they would allow them to operate, but not other people. Well, the feds called that racketeering, and they had this thing called the RICO Act. And so, anyway, and I'm going to sue them, but that's a different story. So back to the trial. So now I got Leloy, and I used to think he was just mad at me because over our altercation. But after four years, I realized, no, they just went after him. He was the new John Weber. Because you got to remember, John Weber, the guy that busted over a 1,000 of them, we all thought, well, man, that was just one bad apple in the barrel. No, the whole barrel is rotten because they get paid. My dad, who was in law enforcement for over 40 years, later worked for the FBI. This is a good story. He told me, son, it's easy. You want to know who did what any crime? He says, it's easy. You just follow the money. Whoever got paid, that's who did it. And so there's two reasons why the police target medical cannabis patients to this day in the state of Hawaii. One is matching funds. They get dollar for dollar from the feds to do it. Dollar for dollar once the bus starts. So they pull you over and you're smoking a doobie in your car. Once they start that investigation, they get matching funds dollar to dollar all the way up through prosecution. And guess where the money comes from? This is crazy. It took me a while to find it out. It comes out of the defense fund because they call us domestic terrorists. 
because you got to remember, cannabis is still illegal federally. Domestic so terrorists? They, they give every state in America matching funds to go after cannabis users, regardless of your medical or not. But then the other kick in the pants is administrative forfeiture. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but our, law, our legislators just passed Stop Doing Administrative Forfeiture. And what administrative forfeiture is, is that they take, they can take up to $100,000 any of your property. They charge your property. So like I say, you get pulled over smoking a doobie in your car, they just take your car and they don't even charge you. 25% of the time on administrative forfeiture, and they do over $5 million of that on the Big Island. So I don't know how much it is statewide. Anyway, our legislators just passed a law against it, and the governor vetoed it. And you got to remember, administrative forfeiture, like the money I took, I was found not guilty. They took the money out of my cash register that I was using to pay my taxes with, and they confiscated it, and guess what? Even though I'm not guilty, do I get that money back? No, it's gone. That's administrative forfeiture. Yep. And talk about, um, yep. what yep. do you call that, oh, conflict of interest. Yes. Guess who gets the money? Yes. The cops do. The cops get a quarter, the prosecutors get a quarter, and the attorney general gets the other 50 cents. Now, and so we are coming that, down. We'll talk about the conflict of interest. So my point is, why would they ever decide not to take your stuff when not only do all they got to do is decide they want it, get to take it, but they get it personally. Right, now, <laughs> and then they just did an audit on, on administrative forfeiture last year, and it was a scathing report because what they said was they don't even keep track of all the stuff that they uh, steal yeah, my, until they auction it. My. And so like, there was millions of dollars of stuff missing. And this is important because you got to remember that uh, the cop that arrested me in this case is being charged with stealing evidence my, out of the evidence room. Okay, Mike. Whoa. We are. Uh, I don't I, when, mention his name because yeah. he's currently under the gun, and I really, I actually feel sorry for the poor guy. Listen, he Mike. Doesn't oh. have that all competent. Pardon me. We are down to forty-three seconds. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. You know, no, we, maybe no. we'll finish this story we, later. We will because I wanted to bring up what's we going on over here, and we're trying to fix it right now. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to run this up to the Supreme Court. They just passed a new law that said questions of statewide concern can go up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and we're, my, we're filing my, today. Okay, and now. Can patients transfer to each other? <laughs> Mike, <laughs> Mike, 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 hey, we are about to run out of time. 13 seconds. You will come back and we'll finish the story next week. Sounds great. Okay. Hey, aloha, everybody. Thanks for listening. Aloha. And we'll see you next yep. time. All right.